Coming up on this week in computer hardware, Intel's latest Ice Lake CPUs make mobile gaming better. AMD has got a patch coming to help Ryzen 3000 performance. Amazon announced a ton of Fire TV devices, USB-C audio adapters, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 532, recorded on September 5th, 2019. Mobile Intel Ice Lake Gaming and a big Ryzen update. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Gazelle, the trusted online marketplace for buying and selling used devices. Visit gazelle.com slash twit to buy a certified pre-owned device and get $20 off your first order. And by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. Yes, it's that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. Twitch Weekly Show, the names to bring you all the hardware news, desktops, laptops, a whole lot of mobile in my life this week, consoles, the internet of stuff, audio joy, video hell. Well, actually, we try to keep the video happiness. But big week for Sebastian. We got updates on Ice Lake Benchmarks, AMD Ryzen 3000. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Sebastian, can you hear me, sir? I can. I am not in Excellent. a car. You know, it uh, normally works so well, but uh, the spot I was, I had, I, had, I had found the perfect spot, 100 megabit down, 40 megabit up, and I don't know what happened, but it was not functioning at all when I went back to that spot. It had shade, too, so my lighting would have been more even. Um, I also want to give a shout-out. Uh, never underestimate the glorious power, which I'm not actually using it right now, but, like, sure call amplifiers for your cell phones. They can be amazing. Just want to point that out. We've uh, talked about those in the past. Um, Ice Lake i7 1065G7 versus Ryzen 7 3700U. What's the word going on with Ice Lake? How are you, how are you feeling about the Ice Lake evolution? <laughs> well, from a CPU standpoint, if you followed the, the news so far, I mean, they're, they're not the most overwhelming product. They are right. basically with, with their transition, which has been a very painful one, the 10 nanometer from 14, They've had a lot of growing pains. This was delayed quite a bit. And they don't even have 10 nanometer parts across the entire 10th gen family, as we discussed with uh, the Comet Lake launch, which is 14 nanometer 10th gen. Right. Ice Lake is 10 nanometer 10th gen. The most important thing about this to me is the graphics side, which is exactly why Jim, our managing editor, went through. He actually picked up a AMD laptop and this 10th gen Ice Lake laptop mm -hmm. and just wanted to compare. He did some basic CPU comparisons, but really on mobile, AMD doesn't come close to Intel with CPU performance. And that's just the function of the fact that they're still on Zen Plus architecture on mobile, right. even though it's called the 3000 series. So that 3700U branding for the AMD laptop CPU is just that. It's just rebadging a 2000 series part, essentially. But you do have right. the Vega 10 graphics, and it's it's, a, it's an APU. And APU graphics has just dominated Intel. Intel has been basically a laughing stock when it comes to integrated graphics for a long time. They've been a punchline. And so if you actually look, even though the form factors of these laptops are very different, because the Ice Lake model is that first shipping 10th gen laptop, which is the L Dell XPS mm -hmm. 13 2-in-1, the ThinkPad T, was it the T495, is a thicker laptop. It's more of a, your traditional ThinkPad business-style right. laptop. But anyway, forgetting what their intended purposes are, looking at... I'll skip past CPU because, you know what? Unless it's a very particular benchmark, a very particular use case, the Intel is faster. It was faster almost... All of the time, like the like, if you looked at a breakdown of PC Mark, yeah, on the rendering test, the AMD CPU is faster, but everything else went to Intel. But if you move over to graphics, beginning with 
uh, Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers, which is the newest addition to that online game. Mm-hmm. Maybe looking at the types of games people would actually play or at the settings they might actually play. And this was using the laptop preset, uh, standard laptop graphics setting preset. The the XPS 2 and one was actually still faster. The Gen 11 graphics are worlds better than they have been. That's kind of the the upshot here is that while if you scroll through benchmark results from these various games, mm-hmm. while AMD typically has a lead, it's not anything like it once was. You're still above, like for one example would be uh, like oh, F1 2018 still went Intel, it went Intel's way. It was at like 40 to 60 frames per second or more. And then moving up to like Far Cry 5, the low 1080p right. preset, where with an APU on that Lenovo laptop, you're at unplayable frame rates. The thing is, you're still kind of unplayable. I mean, it's with Intel, it's significantly <laughs> faster. You and not go in from, a good way. <laughs> no, I mean, like 15 frames per second is unplayable, but with the Intel, you can be at 20 frames per second. That's still way better. The percentages are huge, but it's still not playable. So you'd have to play it at a lower resolution than 1080p on that particular laptop. But like Grand Theft Auto Five, there's another example. It was technically mm-hmm. playable if you consider 30 frames per second playable with the APU. But with the Intel part, you're over 40, even over 50 frames per second. So it. W- what's interesting to me about this is that it, at times looking at gaming performance on integrated graphics is purely ac- an academic exercise what you're seeing is that Intel has caught up. And in fact, in many cases, Gen 11 graphics on one of these Ice Lake parts is faster than an AMD APU powered laptop. And I would I would love to see in conjunction with the fact that a- Intel just released their beta graphics driver that enables integer scaling. We talked about that with NVIDIA last week, I think. they Because NVIDIA mm-hmm. beat them to the punch. They have it now. And if you get one of these laptops, you can enable integer scaling so you can do like what something with this kind of graphics horsepower is really destined to do, which is either play older games up in a very clear way or even play retro games. And I would love to see an Intel Nook with Gen 11 graphics to be like my next little retro gaming station. But yeah, I mean, I we didn't get too far into the, the laptops themselves. Like we didn't do battery life tests and stuff on them yet. Just in, wanted to get a quick look at how competitive Ice Lake with Gen 11 Iris Plus graphics can be versus, you know, a, a high-end Ryzen APU, and it's doing very well. I'll be very curious to see what the battery benchmarks look like because that was always a place where Intel certainly had a huge lead uh, over AMD. Uh, at least in the limited exposure I had to AMD laptops over the last few years. Um, do you think the majority, I mean, do a lot of people, you know, are there a lot of sort of business users that are trapped into hotels where any kind of 3D gaming improvement on Intel is a big deal to them? Or is this more sort of a stalking horse for the graphics uh, gains that Intel's hoping to make in the next few years as they launch their own discrete GPUs? I think there is, there are enough people, if you can believe Steam survey results, and I know AMD has complained about Steam hardware surveys and how those mm-hmm. results are obtained and how certain circumstances like internet cafes, for example, skew numbers towards Intel or NVIDIA. But the top 10 and then like the top 20, if you're looking at graphics cards that are being used to play Steam games, they're mobile. They're Intel integrated graphics. It's like NVIDIA, 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 Intel, Intel, NVIDIA, Intel. They, they, and then maybe within the top 10, there might be like an RX 480 or 580 from AMD mm-hmm. and there are so many people playing games on laptops that their only option is the Intel integrated graphics. And at that point you're then making these concessions to quality and resolution until it plays at an acceptable frame rate. So right. huge increases to graphics horsepower from Intel integrated graphics on even a thin and light two in one laptop like the Dell XPS means that if you do choose to play a game on your laptop, you don't have to go all the way down to 720p at the lowest possible settings. Maybe you can do 1080p low or you can do 720 high. Like, I think it's a big deal just because 
like you said, you might be somewhere with a laptop and you didn't pay the extra $100 or $200 to buy a beefier laptop with, with a discrete GPU. And sometimes there are cases where if you predominantly do work, you wouldn't want the discrete GPU because it might hinder your overall battery life. But you'd still want the right. ability to play games. I mean, there are plenty of games. So the most popular game in the world is Fortnite, and it does not require anything more than, you know, a low-end graphics card to play. So if you can play that at right. an acceptable frame rate, you're probably going to be happy. But, you know, it's it's a start, and it it was enough of an improvement in performance that kind of starts to make me think, maybe they have something here with this discrete GPU push that we're apparently going to see next year. Because they've certainly, they've certainly brought over the engineering for it. If you're not familiar, their graphics chief was amd's graphics uh chief graphics architect just a year or so ago so I mean, they have they have the people they have the technology an interesting story came out with an even more interesting uh response from amd around ryzen 3000 um so uh uh youtuber uh well i say overclocker oc tool designer and youtuber Dare eight hour, uh, which I never pronounce correctly, but I try so hard. Uh, this is right I up. Uh, feel like Mark it's Nexus. Der Bauer, but I I don't think I'm doing Der it. Bauer. Right Der, Der Bauer, Der Bauer. Let's call him Der Bauer. In any case, uh, article we're we're showing you right here is from Hexus.net. Uh, Mark Tyson did the write up, and uh, Der Bauer uh, did an AMD Ryzen 3000 boost survey, and he filtered and kind of removed the trolls and and got to around 2,700, a little over 2,700, what he considered valid submissions. And now there's a lot of different entrants on this, but the general, uh, the general, the, the picture, the big picture, as it were, was that uh, in terms of uh, AMD Ryzen 3000 processors, quote, achieving their advertised boost speeds when pushed, it's worse than I thought. Um, and so, you know, when you kind of take a look at this, um, you know, he asked survey participants to run Cinebench R15 single core, monitor HW info with 500 millisecond polling, make sure PBO was turned off. Uh, Derbauer, quote, also touched on survey theory where participants are more likely to come from the satisfaction extremes of the user spectrum. Those with strong opinions are more likely to use their time testing for a survey, i.e. that the audience for this is kind of self-selecting. And... Uh, yeah. Shock, the, the chips that were meeting uh, or most likely to meet expectations were the processors at the lower end of the stack. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote uh, Hexus.net here. About half of the Ryzen 5 3600 users reported their CPUs were boosting correctly to approximately the advertised boost speed of 4200 megahertz. Nearly all the results fell into a plus or minus 100 megahertz zone from the advertised figure. Um, the Ryzen 3600X, not as good, uh, only 9%, 9.4% hitting the advertised boost speeds. And then as you get into up to like the 12-core Ryzen 9 3900X, only 5.6% of entries were seen to have managed to reach the boost speed advertised by AMD. And again, I am quoting from Hexus.net, and I apologize for not rephrasing that. Um, but this is, uh, and of course, Hexus.net is, is, is uh, quoting your Bauer, but... Um, you know, there's still a good value choice in a lot of ways. There's still good performers. And there also leads to a lot of questions maybe around, uh, a cooling consistency, bin sorting. Uh, and it's, this is the kind of survey it's really hard to do. Right. Um, but generally speaking, when most of the people running most of the high end processors, uh, in most of the cases don't hit a whole, uh, you know, hit the numbers you're expecting. Um, that's uh, kind of frustrating. But when you, you know, there's a kind of a full histogram on this, and it's interesting to, to kind of look at this and dig into the data. Um, what's even more interesting, I think, is that uh, uh, AMD made a statement and that they are working on BIOS updates with motherboard manufacturers to, quote, address a firmware issue that is identified. Um, and, uh, Tuesday's the 10th of September. There will be more information about a new BIOS and optimizations. So 
Uh, it's interesting, right? While processor, this is AMD, while processor boost frequency is dependent on many variables, including workload, system design, and cooling solution, we have closely reviewed the feedback from our customers and have identified an issue in our firmware that reduces boost frequency in some situations. We are in the process of preparing a BIOS update for our motherboard partners that addresses the issue and includes additional boost performance optimizations. We will provide an update on September 10th to the community regarding the availability of the BIOS. So this, I think, is kind of a big deal, right? Right? Because yeah. AMD is like, hey, you know, we're not responsible for all the people that slather on too much, you know, <laughs> thermal paste or use a crappy cooler or improperly install a cooler or are living in Arizona and don't have air conditioning or don't have proper. You know, what I mean, there's there's a ton of variables that can make for radical differences in the thermals on the chip, which, of course, will cause the chip to throttle back on its boost site or boost frequency. But they're like, you know, there's a thing here that we could do better that would probably deliver the results that people expect. Um, that's about as close to a, or well, that is a mea culpa. That's about as blunt a statement on this is like, we're going to fix this. Uh, and then the $64,000 question is how long it takes BIOS vendors to kind of implement that and make it available to the end users. Are you excited or is this kind of like, hmm... What could I be but excited at getting to retest everything <laughs> all over again? Because when they say they're going to make a new BIOS available, what they're saying is they're going to give a new combo update to the motherboard vendors who then have to produce the BIOS updates for customers, which right. means we're going to be on yet another AGISA version. I will say, though, from pre-launch AGISA, which we've talked about, as exciting as mm -hmm. this is, we're talking about version numbers and appended version numbers with letter codes at the end of them, what they right. did initially and have kept up is a reduction. They've capped voltages. They've put a reduction in voltage that the CPU can use under load and actually at idle. But right, and that's the big difference. Really, is I, and it's it feels almost like it feels exactly like these processors were released too soon. They didn't have enough time to figure out exactly what they could get out of the seven nanometer process consistently. And absolutely there are CPUs that exist that hit the advertised frequencies, which they are now calling the maximum boost instead of just the boost frequency. So trying to be more realistic <laughs> about this, but at the same time, right. they're giving themselves some leeway because they might produce a hundred of this CPU and out of that hundred, 10 are hitting the absolute highest boost all the time. And then the other 90, it's variable. And maybe the bottom of this group only hit, like isn't even within 100 megahertz of it. But it's, it's. I was thinking about this, I was actually talking about this before the show. Uh, think about the old days of CPUs where you'd buy a CPU and then there was just, there was, if you got the right seller on, you could overclock at 150 megahertz. But if you didn't get the right one, you maybe could only get another 20 or 40 megahertz out of it, but you always had right. room. Overclocking is not anywhere near what it used to be because CPUs basically have overclocking built in. These boost targets that they have where they're allowed to increase voltage by a certain amount safely within certain thermal constraints. If you're so far from the TJ Maxx temperature, then you can boost up to this like frequency within this window. And this, this is all being handled automatically within the CPU and with your motherboard. And it's it's like they pushed as far as they possibly could right. this this new architecture and this this new process. And they were being as aggressive as they could be to get to the clocks they advertised. And not all the chips can even hit that. I, I would have liked it if they had said, you know what? Some of these can hit 4.7, some of them only hit 4.4. Let's just say it's 4.4 and hey, you know, these overclock pretty well. See how much extra you can get out of your CPU and maybe advertise like this will hit 4.4, but you could potentially hit a peak frequency of up to, of up to 4.7 in the right circumstances. And that's how they sell it on the GPU side. They have their base, their gaming, and then their peak clocks. And which they call boost on the, the consumer side. But with the CPU side, it's raised some questions which they're now having, having to address. The Gerbauer article got picked up by a bunch of different outlets. He has quite a few followers on his YouTube channel. He's very influential himself. 
within the enthusiast community, the overclocking community. And AMD's statement tells me, you know what? They're probably just going to do a limited window voltage boost to, for whatever duration, will safely increase voltage back up to those pre-launch levels. So you're hitting those original frequencies. Because as I mentioned last week or the week before with the 3600X, uh, they capped the voltage. It's literally capped at 1.44 volts now under the latest versions of AGISA, where before it could go all the way up to 1.5 if it needed to. It was routinely over 1.48. So that reduction in voltage means that when it's stepping up, it runs basically runs into a wall where it just has to, it just flatlines. And it was definitely resulting in lower overall frequencies. So I'm curious to see what they do. I'm sure it'll end up being some sort of limited duration return to what they have apparently since regarded as unsafe operating voltages over the life of the CPU, which is why they decided to dial them back after launch. Hmm. And the exact opposite of dialing back for launch uh, <laughs> would be uh, the latest that will be coming in October from Intel. Intel's Core i9-9900KS. That's the one that Intel says is going to be 5 gigahertz on all the cores. It'll hit 5 gigahertz on all the cores. Um, this was kind of a surreal uh, article for me to read up on Tom's hardware, uh, and I'm sure it was for you also, Sebastian. Vice President of Tech Leadership Marketing, John Carvel, and Chief Performance Strategist, Ryan Shrout. Why does that name sound so familiar? Revealed no. that in a meeting with press here in Berlin ahead of IFA, while also hinting at Cascade Lake X and discussing its position in mobile in a, as its 10th gen chips hit the market. Um, this could write up Intel's 5 gigahertz Core i9-9900KS chips next month. Cascade Lake X offering two x perf per dollar it's up on tom's hardware.com um so uh uh so intel was showing hitman 2 running the 9900 or i should say uh, more accurately the 9900 ks uh and uh, uh andrew friedman from tom's hardware noted that it was in fact minus the occasional dip did hit five gigahertz on all cores uh and uh, Shrout, who, of course, is a previous host of This Week in Computer Hardware and the founding host of the show, who now works for Intel, Pound. That's a notification there. It's an update. Uh, you know, we're making you aware of that in case you're new. Uh, Shrout said uh, it was Corsair 240 millimeter AIO uh, liquid cooler and an RTX 2080 Ti on the GPU side of things. So uh, this is a good sign. Um, we'll be really, really curious to see that chip uh, get released and perhaps uh, yeah. uh, running something a little more aggressive, but more aggressive in things. Um, when uh, they also talked about the Cascade Lake X, um, there's a chart you're looking at right now. Uh, that's actually, yeah, empowering creators where they're talking about, quote, relative performance per dollar on next gen X series and compared to Skylake X. Uh, in their relative performance based on, um, well, something. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing. But, you know, it's well, there's no starting it, point it, and an end point on the chart. Right, but but based on Skylake X, you're going to get twice as much performance per dollar, uh, which uh, Tom's Hardware Notes might be suggesting a price cut. So yeah, just a uh, bit. Yeah, just a bit. So more stuff coming from Intel in October. It looks to be fast, uh, and I'll be really, 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 really curious to see the 9900 KS performance uh, in the wild, as it were. Uh, I, I also wonder. I want a price, which they still have not revealed. There's no TDP, and there's no price. If I you don't cringe, it's not a it's not a flagship Intel part. Yeah. <laughs> Although this also, of course, gives motivation for AMD to get the 3900X out and running and to get the best possible BIOS uh, or firmware or updates for the, you know, the Aegis into the motherboard manufacturers so people can maximize performance so they look as good as possible against the next, next flagship from Intel. Uh, it'll be interesting. So you might be thinking right now, it's time to buy a new chip, and I know that feeling. I myself am waiting, furiously waiting, to update uh, my desktop PC with a 3700X, although I dream of a 3900X. Um, 
But I mentioned this because this week in computer hardware is brought to you by Gazelle, the trusted online marketplace for buying certified pre-owned devices, which is a way of saying saving money on the gear you need to do your job and enjoy your day, right? You got goals, professional, personal goals. Um, having the right tools to tackle that can be fiscally challenging, uh, can be painful. Sometimes you look at the price of things. I gasp occasionally. They want how much for that phone? You know, and what's cool about Gazelle, right? They get the products in. Devices are available in various conditions, good and excellent at a great price. Everything from an iPhone 6 through iPhone XS Max. Uh, they have a variety of Samsung Galaxy and Pixel phones at great prices. MacBooks, Air and Pro, iPad, Standard Air and Pro. And the prices are pretty good, right? They go through a 30-point inspection. They're back with a 30-day return policy. There's no restocking fee, uh, free shipping. Sold without a carrier contract and available for support by major carriers or unlocked. I love buying unlocked stuff. Buying unlocked devices that have been tested and inspected and don't involve me running around to meet people in strange places on on, on, on online sales sites whose name I won't mention. This is great. They have a firm doing financing for all the devices. You get instantly approved. You have three, six, or 12 months to pay off. Uh, all you have to do is select financing with a firm at checkout. I actually used this uh, to buy a device not too long ago. It's fantastic and it's easy. And look, Gazelle has an incredible selection of quality pre-owned devices. They're an excellent choice for students. And if you don't know what to do with your old devices, remember the thing with the hardware and the updates? Check out Gazelle for competitive offers on your used phones, tablets, or computers. If you're looking around and you can see a laptop you don't use, a tablet you don't use, go to gazelle.com and see what they'll give you for it. Level up with new tech from Gazelle. Visit gazelle.com slash twit to buy a certified pre-owned device and get $20 off your first order. That's gazelle.com slash T-W-I-T to buy a certified pre-owned device at a great price. We want to thank gazelle.com slash twit for their support of this weekend computer hardware. I love buying used gear and having someone else check it out it saves me time. And they deliver it to my house. No sitting around in the food cart with a pocket full of cash wondering, is this the time when it all goes wrong? <laughs> my wife once looked at me you're going where to buy what isn't there a better way of doing this it's like no <laughs> no one has this lens oh my goodness um sources we love sources this is one of the primary ways that apple communicates with the uh the community or at least the media community um in-screen fingerprint tech to uh, work alongside Face ID for the 2020, 2021 iPhones and a, quote, low-cost 4.7-inch phone for the first half of 2020. Uh, nice Bloomberg article on that. If you covet Touch ID, if you miss Touch ID, if the whole face thing just skeeves you out, uh, as it does me, uh, this is good. And also uh, cheap iPhones, I think, are also good. So 2020, of course, there will be new phones and... Uh, I kind of really like this idea, right? Uh, it was like 2013, um, Apple bought Authentech Incorporated. It's one of the pioneers in fingerprint scanning. Um, I'll be really, 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 really curious. Uh, and I also got to say, uh, I like the fingerprint readers I've, I've played around with other people's phones that are embedded in the screen. Um, I like it. I like it a lot. It'll work in tandem uh, with the Face ID system, Bloomberg says. Uh, or I should say, Bloomberg reports that, quote, the people familiar with Apple's plans said. Uh, Apple, of course, declined to comment. So I'll be really, really curious also to see what the specs end up being on that new low-cost iPhone. That's about it for Apple rumors this week, which is an unusually low amount. But I'm going to give a shout-out to Jay Ross, who emailed twitch at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. He says, regarding Hackintosh, I wanted to let you know the latest versions of OS X will run on the Ryzen and Threadripper platforms. Information about this is at amd-osx.com. Just wanted to let you know, so you might try this route. Thanks for the show, guys. Keep up the good work, J. Ross. J. Ross, thank you for the update on that. Um, there's uh, If you go to kb.amd-osx.com, that's the knowledge base, and it is fascinating to read and has me contemplating terrible, terrible things I might do uh, with one of my Ryzen processors that's in a box at home. Because it's been a long time since I've run OS X, and Hackintoshes make me happy on a deep molecular level. 
Um, something that uh, kind of dropped at the last minute. There's a crazy um, Amazon basically made their own ginormous, uh, you know, watch the presentation with us from Aoife in Berlin. Uh, blog that about Amazon.co.uk slash innovation slash fire dash TV dash event dash live dash from dash Berlin. Um, and Gadget did a really nice summary of it. Uh, basically, it comes down to a whole lot of Fire TV devices are coming. Uh, they've done a major update to the Cube. They've got an anchor sound bar coming. A bunch of TV sets, including, I am told, an OLED model. Uh, John Fingus over at Engadget did a nice write-up on this one. Um, I personally think AMD has several too many AMD, pardon me, Amazon. Amazon and AMD, two very different organizations. I, I personally, at this point, think there are almost, well, there are, there are, there are just too many Amazon Fire devices uh, between the tablets and the various home theater devices and the various devices that sit in the corner of the house that listen to you. Um, but uh, they're talking about like 20 Fire TV devices. Um, the uh, 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 It's uh, it's pretty out of control, right? So um, six-core processor uh, that's about twice as powerful uh, for the Fire TV Cube. Support for 4K and Dolby Vision HDR. Content up to 60 frames per second. Um, a bunch of the voice controls are going to be hosted on the device, uh, which means it, it gets much faster. Uh, according to Engadget, four times faster. So you're not going to sit there and suffer waiting for the Cube. Um, and there's... Uh, it's kind of crazy when you look at this um the uh you know because I'm, I'm looking at the amazon blog entry um and uh amazon blog day one and right fire tv is only five years old and uh so they've got the new fire tv cube they've got the fire tv edition of the nebula soundbar which is anchor soundbar um it's not a, a bad sandbar. Probably not my the first one to go to, but uh, Anchor's done a lot of good work. Um, a Toshiba 65-inch 4K Ultra HD Smart TV, uh, the HDR Fire TV di uh, edition. So um, one of the things that I did not know is Amazon and Best Buy, basically Amazon's like, look, working with Best Buy, we sold millions of Insignia and Toshiba Fire TV edition Smart TVs, uh, which I think I've seen one in my life. Um outside of a Best Buy. Uh, but they're talking about a 65-inch uh, Toshiba with Dolby Vision. Uh, that's going to be available next month. They're going to add more Fire TVs in Europe, uh, more Fire TV devices in France, Italy, and Spain. Um, so lots of European stuff. But uh, the big one is the Fire TV Cube. Um, and the performance on that is a huge update from the existing one. So if you're a fan of the Amazon uh a l e x a ecosystem if you are deeply tied into amazon prime uh if you like their control system this is probably something you want to think about and painfully even if you have an existing uh fire tv cube this is probably going to be a huge update between you know locating the the, the some of the voice response on the device itself um that kind of for voice control that kind of response increase is unbelievably uh good i'm uh I'm delighted. <laughs> I'm looking at this like, you know, 4x increase in the response to things like go home, select number one, opening up channels. Uh, that's a huge, huge, huge difference. Let's just start shipping on October 10th in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K., and Germany, and then Japan in November. Um, this is exciting. I'm kind of really curious to see what they do uh, moving forward. But I will say I also feel that there's just too many freaking fire products. Um, <laughs> that may just be because, uh, I, I'm not that deeply tied into the ecosystem, but there's amazing how many devices are out there. So got an interesting, uh, question from, uh, Rob Trevino. He says, I just got a new note 10 plus. Can you recommend a USB C DAC? There are a ton of cheap ones and I can't figure out which one is good. I want to drive my Sennheiser HD 599s. Um, so first of all, excellent. You got a nice set of headphones to start with, which is the, the thing I recommend most to people is there's no point in spending a bunch of money on a, on a nice DAC if you don't have decent transducers, something to turn uh, you know, the electrical signals from the device into the audio waves that impact your eardrums that you interpret as sound. Um, but uh, I was also laughing. Uh, there's a great... You pointed out, Sebastian, that YouTube's been hiding these videos, but 
Samsung made a went to great production. They spent time and treasure putting together videos making fun of Apple for eliminating the headphone jack. Um, oh yeah. And, uh, you know, we found one of the YouTube videos where it's basically like, ha ha, they removed the headphone jack, stupid Apple. Uh, and of course, now Samsung is removing the headphone jack to make more space for a battery. Another 100 milliamps, which I'm not sure I would trade 100 milliamps. 1,000 milliamps, I would cheerfully trade for a headphone jack, but 100 seems kind of weak. But uh, so in any case, Note 10, Note 10 Plus, uh, they have eliminated the headphone jack. Um, my go-to for USB DACs, our audio quest dragonflies uh, the red is great for powering uh the kind of magnetic planar headphones that usually make uh you know you can it's funny because you can often make them play just fine with the with the audio or the headphone jack on uh your phone uh especially if that phone is an iphone uh some of the lesser you know i had a i want to say a, a g4 an lg g4 and it was uh it was dis it was the first time I understood why so many people I knew had um, uh, had uh, uh, external headphone amplifiers for their phones. Like I had stopped using them for a while because the ones in the iPhones were actually pretty good if your headphones weren't too demanding. Um, so uh, you know, I'm actually about to test the Cobalt, which is this critter right here, their latest kind of crazy high powered one. I'll be I've got a set of. Uh, Planar Magnetics from Mr. Speakers that I'm going to be thrashing with this or thrash this with them. Um, but almost all the devices out there are USB, standard USB-A type connectors, and you're going to use a USB-C cable or adapter to connect them. Um, you know, this Cobalt actually comes with the rather burly and reasonably heavily built uh, Dragon Tail, which is like a $22 USB-C adapter. Um, which looks a lot like that. Um, I actually own at least three of Anchor's $8 USB-C to USB 3.1 adapters. Um, those are OTG cables. Those cost like $8. They're inexpensive. They're bomb-proof. I've never killed one. I've just misplaced one and then ended up with multiples uh, in, in, in many places in my home. But I would absolutely recommend uh, the black, unless you have a really demanding pair of planar magnetics, I think the black is good. Um, some people whose opinions I trust, Brent Butterworth or some other folks uh, over at the wire cutter think the red sounds a little bit better. Part of that is is kind of the the increased capabilities of the amplifier, and they do some different stuff with the DAC. But that's those are kind of my go to. Um, and for a a, uh, a audio quest dragonfly black will cost you ninety nine dollars and is a phenomenal device. Uh, it sounds really good. Um, if you have a good set of headphones and you want to experiment with, with upgrading your DAC, that's a way to get into that scene without spending a, a, a ton of money. And they do a really good job. So while we're talking about phones, we should probably thank the folks over at ExpressVPN. This week in computer hardware is brought to you by ExpressVPN. If you don't think you're being snooped on, you're in denial. Um, you're wrong. <laughs> I just want to point that out. Your credit card, your ISP, pretty much everything in life uh, that that you communicate with that involves computers or or dedicated devices that uh, have computers inside of them, they're they're just they're snuffing out information and often figuring out ways to resell it to other people. Um, look, I know you understand your privacy is under attack. You listen to this show. Hackers, governments, ISPs, they're sucking down your data and figuring out how to make money off of it, which is why I recommend if you're online using a VPN like ExpressVPN. Right? Powerful encryption secures your data, runs in the background of your computer or your phone. You use the internet just like you normally do. You download the app, you click to connect, you're protected. Right? Just don't go online without a VPN. And ExpressVPN, one of the fastest VPNs we've tried, costs less than seven bucks a month, comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. They have a really interesting, a new cutting edge server technology they call Trusted Server. Prevents the operating system and apps from ever writing to the hard drive. How crazy is that, right? It's a whole new standard of privacy and security by making sure your data doesn't end up in places you don't want it. It's time to stop hackers, big brother, and internet companies from grabbing all your data. Take back your online privacy with ExpressVPN. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I use ExpressVPN constantly in, you know, I, I'm, I'm the kind of crazy person that will use, you know, <laughs> the airport 
Wi-Fi, but I don't go online without you know, a virtual private network, a VPN running like ExpressVPN. That helps secure me by creating a secure connection from my computer to their servers so that nobody that's snuffing around packets on that airport can get to my data. I like that. Makes me feel safer, actually makes me safer, and that's a good thing. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three extra months free with a one-year package at expressvpn.com slash twitch. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash T-W-I-C-H for three extra months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash twitch to learn more. And we want to thank ExpressVPN for their support of this weekend computer hardware. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you got your earballs on the uh, inside of listening to HyperX's Cloud Orbit S gaming headset, which is a lot like uh, Odyssey's Mobius gaming headset. In fact, I feel like it is almost the exact same thing, but with a different color enclosure. What do you think, Sebastian? You, know, you, you could say that. I will say there is one big <laughs> difference between these two, and it's that mm -hmm. even though this does incorporate a battery just like the Mobius, it does not have any Bluetooth connectivity. So apparently they left that chip out or it's disabled. Oh, so you, you can That's, only use this with a cable, though it does have a battery, which is interesting, I, but uh, I'll explain why. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's messy. I actually will say uh, using the Mobius headset with Bluetooth was one of my favorite ways to use to to use it. I also noticed, uh, and I'm sure you're going to amplify this statement, that I almost never used any of the fancy gaming stuff they built into the Odyssey Mobius. Um, how did you feel about the sort of 3D sound expansion, head tracking stuff in that uh, HyperX Cloud Orbit S? Uh, to be diplomatic, it's bad, and I didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> It's. I mean, that's pretty gracious. Here's the idea. The idea is that you create this sort of virtual environment, and mm -hmm. it's it's kind of like a VR thing, but for sound. So let me take you on an audio journey where you create a, a space of whatever size, because there's a slider that makes it sound bigger or smaller by adding basically more rever reverberation to the effect. But then the the sound comes from a central point, and you can use the software to calibrate what your center is like you stare right. at your monitor you hit center and then from that point on as you turn your head it's precisely tracking your head movements with accelerometers that are in the ear cups and saying oh you've gone you know this many degrees down and to the left and then the sound moves uh within your headphones so that it still appears that it's coming from the exact same point in space so what this essentially means is if I turn my head to the left, the sound moves more into the right channel. So it still seems to be coming from that exact spot that I had been looking at and so on. And it gets significantly worse as far as realism goes if you turn your head all the way around because I've, I've never found a surround headset that claims to be 7.1 channel that can actually convince me there's any sound coming from behind me. I had one that was really close. Uh, but most of the implementations of 7.1 channel surround kind of lose me after the the side left and right, like the surround left right, because there also is a rear left right in a 7.1 mix. But if you turn off this 3D feature, which is a Waves NX 3D audio feature, and forget about that whole virtual environment and the point in space, then these just become a pair of 300 to 330 dollar and the $330 one is the one that actually has this capability though and here's the headphones themselves there is actually a button to fully disable the 3d function right on the ear cup so if you don't like it you just turn it off but you pay $30 for the ability to try it out and then turn it off if you don't like it so 299 for the version without 329 for the version with and otherwise, they're identical. Uh, they're, they use planar magnetic technology, planar magnetic drivers. And I'm sure Patrick can explain <laughs> exactly what that is to anybody who's not familiar with this. Because it's not oh like a goodness. regular driver, right? Right. So essentially, um, I, I, was, I was about to like grab the headphone next to me and pull 
uh, the covering, uh, uh, the, 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 the ear pads do off, it, which then of course science. require. No, cause they're mine and I bought them with my own money. And then I would have to basically drive to San Diego to have them glued together, which would create huge marital issues, uh, for me. <laughs> if I disappeared to San Diego for two days, I, I suppose technically I could ship them there, but we've talked about this before, right? When you think of headphones or a speaker that you look at, normally there's a big cone out of paper or some super fancy substance. The cone is attached to a magnet. The magnet is surrounded by a coil. Electricity is run through the coil and the speaker moves back and forth and generates the sound waves that you hear, generates, you know, moves the air and that hits your eardrums. With planar magnetics, part of what makes music or gaming soundtracks more accurate is the ability to accelerate or decelerate that moving mass that moves the air much more quickly. So, you know, basically like a race car, you put bigger brakes on it to stop it faster and you put a bigger engine in it to make it go faster. But even more important is reducing the amount of mass you have to sling around the racetrack. One of the ways of doing that with headphones with a planar magnetic is you essentially take a fancy sheet of plastic, an incredibly thin sheet of plastic, you tension it and there are uh, basically wires printed on the surface of that and it's suspended in between a couple of magnets. Now there's a lot of fancier things that are going on, but essentially um, you have the ability to accelerate and decelerate this plane, this large flat surface. It moves back and forth and generates the signals that are hitting your ear, the, the audio that's hitting your ear. And what's really, really cool about it is because it's this incredibly thin light sheet of material with all of this electricity running through it in between these incredibly strong magnets, they can accelerate and decelerate that really fast. And one one of the things to do to make audio sound more accurate, whether it's, you know, a sniper rifle shot in a video game or, you know, the sound of a symbol after you hit it is by controlling the deceleration, acceleration of that, of that, uh, that transducer by, by being able to slow it really, really well or control the decay on audio, you get a much more accurate, um, ex or audio experience. It's, it's the difference between it's, you know, I could talk about this for hours. Let's just say planar magnetic, good. The stuff inside the Mobius, uh, the, the drivers they built for the Mobius, which, uh, I believe are the same drivers in the, the HyperX headphones are really, really impressive and a big step above what most people have ever heard in a huge step above the average crap that's inside of most uh, gaming headsets. Because most gaming headsets, the audio is a distant, low cost, what's the cheapest thing we can throw in there afterthought that is distantly behind, how can we make it look more spacey and where can we put more LEDs on it? Sir. Yeah, I mean, this is, <laughs> as you say, I mean, that's... And, and I, I regret not putting a graphic in the review. I need to address that. That actually shows like the breakdown of what these drivers are and how they differ from a regular speaker or rather regular driver and headphone. But these, it's it's difficult to explain to somebody in words why a planar driver might be different or what its advantages are. You talked about speed, which is exactly it. Like, and I have planar magnetic speakers. I have a pair of Magnapans I've had for a few years. And it's a very different kind of sound and they have their weaknesses like Magnapans and the Magnapan owner knows you're not getting like deep sub bass out of these right. things. You get a purity of sound, which you can only really get by being able to control the driver as well as they can. Mm -hmm. But you, and you get a volume of sound that's different because the, the driver is so much physically large. Like th these are 100 right. millimeter drivers headphone. Most gaming headsets are 50 millimeter. Some are 40, right. but somewhere in between those two numbers. And here you have 100 millimeters of an extremely responsive material that is being moved in a way that allows you to control the sound so much better than you could with a standard speaker cone. Right. But it has its disadvantages, one of which is that it requires a lot more power than a really efficient cone might. Right. The and planar magnetics have gotten a lot more efficient, and it really depends a lot on which planar magnetic drive you're using. There are some that are, are adequately driven off of a headphone jack on a phone. I think all of them improve with the addition of an external amplifier. Um, yeah. The uh, I think there's a, a I don't know if, if that showed up in uh, 
uh, I don't know if it's showing up in the rundown, but I just dropped in a picture of a uh, an Odyssey driver from a more expensive uh, planar magnetic headphone. But it gives you the basic idea, um, you know, by it's <laughs> it's smaller than I thought. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but if you look at that, there's there's sort of if you're going from sort of left of right, um, you've got uh, you've got. Uh, you know, sort of the the external cover to keep you from the grill, to keep you from poking your fingers in it. The phaser, which is essentially a very uh, craftily designed magnet, or I should say the phaser, then the, the stator with the magnets, which is the fancy magnet, then the, quote, ultra-thin substrate. And that's the part that actually moves, and it has uh, circuits traced on it. And they, they basically look like somebody, you know, skiing down the side of a mountain. And they, by running the uh you know the, the 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 electricity from the amplifier through that uh that fights back and forth against um the stators and moves that big flat panel what's kind of crazy about planar magnetic headphones versus some of the massive speakers um uh, the big flat uh you know planar speakers that sebastian was talking about is there's actually some phenomenal low-end bass performance coming out of well-designed current contemporary modern planar magnetic headphones um yeah that i just i i find mind-blowing uh and it works out really what turns out what does a kick drum or a, or a b-flat tuba really really well also works quite well for explosions in video games <laughs> so I also He's, am laughing because I'm like, I have to look up Odyssey Phaser because <laughs> I used to know what that was. Um, <laughs> so. This was kind of a, a tale of two different uh, connectivities, like if that's even a word, which it's right. not. But it, these sounded different when they were connected via the USB-C connection on them than when you had them just going with like a 3.5 millimeter analog connection. Because right. when you connect them with analog and they're not getting power from your PC via USB, they're relying mm -hmm. on an internal battery, which they rate at about 10 hours. I found it to be a little bit less because I was listening at much higher volumes. Most battery ratings, I think, are usually at around 50% volume. Sure. But uh, it just didn't really have the punch that it did when plugged in. It felt a little... I'll use some jargon. It felt a bit restrained. It, there was almost <laughs> a dynamic range compression going on because it never got as loud. You could turn them up all the way and have your source, which in this case was an iPhone 10. So of course I'm going through that little adapter, which is part of the problem, but uh, it just never got as loud as when I had it on the PC. I could go like orders of magnitude louder when connected via USB. So really intense moments where you need that added volume because of the the dynamic shifts if you're watching a movie, the soundtracks in films, even though mm -hmm. the trend with music has been to brick wall it so that there's less than a three decibel difference between the quietest and the loudest sounds. With right. movies, there are still times where you can barely hear the dialogue and suddenly there's an explosion rocking you in the theater and something with a lot of that dynamic range is going to make a game soundtrack or a movie soundtrack sound like that, that dynamic experience where you can really... Surprised by an explosion like that. So Surprise. they didn't really have that on batteries to me. And But in general, the sound with these was impressively flat. My last experience with a pair of Odyssey headphones was actually the, the Sign, which was a stupendously expensive pair of on-ear headphones for use with an iPhone predominantly. They had a version that was $50 less, which is an analog right. connection. But that was a, it was a $500 pair of on-ear, so more compact than this, on-ear planar magnetic headphones from like 2016 is when I borrowed these for a review. And mm -hmm. they had this extremely bassy response to them. I had to use their software to turn down the bass about 6 dB for them to sound flat to my ears, but they were right. definitely tuned to a very warm sound signature with a lot of bass. And these sound very flat so i don't know if your experience yeah. with the mobius headphones was the same but the uh no the it was interesting because the the sign was one of the first closed back planar magnetic headphones uh certainly the most affordable one that that odyssey had made and we, we should point out uh, odyssey makes some incredibly expensive headphones for example the gaming headset that they announced this summer 
uh, the LCD GX, which is like a traditional massive, you know, help me Obi-Wan, uh, you know, Danish is strapped to the side of your head, uh, uh, over your planar magnetic, you know, uh, that's an $899, uh, you know, gaming headset. And that is actually fairly inexpensive, um, by, uh, by Odyssey prices at the, I was saying their flagship, I want to say the, the LCD four, that's a $4,000 headphone. So this is a company that is not shy about charging a lot of money uh, for their, you know, for, in your pursuit of excellence with their pursuit of excellence in production. But um, this is also one of those areas where the, there's a pretty serious uh, law of diminishing returns as you throw more money at these things. That's the LCD4 you're looking at right now. That's a big, massive over-ear headphone. I haven't heard one of those in a long time. It would be interesting to to listen to those. Um, in any case, uh, you know, it's... Amazing also how good, you know, I have a HyperX gaming headset uh, that is wired, not wireless, that I think I paid $99 for that is shockingly good. Um, <laughs> you know, so if you hear us talking about $400 gaming headsets and your your eyes are glazing over and your heart is filled with rage, it's okay. There's lots of good bargains out there. Uh, Sony MDR 7506 is a fantastic headphone for gaming or for listening to music uh, or for working in, you know, Premiere um, or any other application with audio. And they typically sell for 90 bucks. And you're going to have to spend a couple hundred dollars before you get something better than that. You're go also going to have to sort of create your own mic. You're going to have to, to buy, a, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, clip-on mic or, or there's adapters you can do to bring a mic to your phone. But... Uh, I guess what I find frustrating is so many gaming headsets are all about style, not about audio quality, and are grossly outperformed by significantly uh, uh, less expensive headphones. I mean, it's it's also amazing, um, you know, in terms of planar magnetics, uh, Monoprice has their 565C, which is an over-ear closed. I bought I bought a pair of these because I was so impressed by them. Um, they sell for two hundred dollars. I've seen them down as low as uh, one hundred and fifty dollars uh, at sort of their open box deals. But this is a phenomenally good head. This is a ridiculously good headphone for the money. To get something better than this uh, in a closed back headphone, you're going to spend probably I would say eight hundred dollars. Uh, new eight hundred eight hundred fifty dollars for a set of Mr. Speakers uh, uh, Aeon uh, flows. So, you know, and if you don't spend a lot of time listening critically to a lot of stuff, it's the differences can be alarmingly subtle. Um, it's I don't know. I find it frustrating because there's so many bad headphones out there and so many bad expensive headphones and earbuds. But uh, you know, Sony MDR seventy five zero six eighty bucks is a fantastic entry level headphone. Um, you know, if you have 25 bucks, uh, email twitch at twit.tv. If you don't want to spend more than 25 bucks, email twitch at twit.tv and I'll remind everybody of what, uh, an excellent $20 headphone option is next week. Um, <laughs> what's good. Samsung really, they're really shipping the, the galaxy fold, right? This time it's happening. Apparently, they have canceled yet again. We heard about the cancellations of <laughs> orders back when this first launched. And then all the review units that started becoming destroyed, whether it was through improper use, carelessness, or just bad design by YouTubers, uh, such as Dieter Bone at The Verge, MKVHD, they recalled all of those. They revisited the design. Apparently, they strengthened it in such a way as they were... They were, going, they were confident they could actually release this product without just scrapping it. My pessimistic outlook on this from the beginning has been this is never going to ship. This is not a this is not a shipping product. This is a prototype. It is not strong enough to withstand the the rigors of day to day smartphone use. And I think part of the problem is that as time has gone on and smartphones have become so commonplace to the point where you can buy an inexpensive, like less than $200 will buy you an inexpensive unlocked smartphone anywhere. Right. Uh, almost everybody who has a cell phone now has some sort of smartphone. It, you have to go out of your way to buy what we now call dumb phones, just a standard smartphone uh, or rather a standard cell phone. I even think of cell phones as being smartphones now. It's They're just inexorably linked from the days when I used to have a little candy bar 
Nokia phone that could literally only make and receive calls unless I hated myself and wanted to try T9 to respond to a text message from somebody <laughs> who was somehow gifted at knowing which number combination with their thumb could send a cogent sentence. I was never good at that. And so when when smartphones with keyboards started to become available, I would lust after I want this HTC whatever. I wanted a Samsung Blackjack. I at one point I had a I had a Palm. The Palm trios were popular for a while. You know, it, and then, of course, the iPhone came out and everybody had to have a smartphone with a touch screen. And so, like, Samsung revisited their strategy famously. And within a year or so, they had very, very similar looking phones. Like, 2008 was the year right. of Android hitting the market and the G1 for the first time. And then, over the course of time, it's just become so incredibly common to have this device I promise I have a point as I rant on and on about this. It is that it's so common to just have one of these things that we treat them rather roughly. We treat them like anything. They, I treat them like my keys. I throw it down on the table. Right. I shove it in my pocket when I leave the house. It's like a wallet or keys. People leave their house with that mental checklist. Uh, wallet, keys, cell phone. And and then they can go. And it, I find it difficult to accept that you're going to have this fragile, folded over extremely expensive smartphone. This is a $2,000 phone, $1,980, but right. a $2,000 phone that is quite fragile in the era of these are disposable items that, you know, we treat roughly and we constantly drop. And I just, apparently they feel some of the same concerns, especially when their hand selected YouTubers were breaking these <laughs> things right and left before launch and talking about it and making this bad press for them. So they bring all these back. They strengthen the hinge a little bit. They maybe cover that exposed part of the screen. People could reach their finger under and rip the screen up with. And they make it very obvious that that plastic layer on top is not just a plastic film. You have to actually leave it there because that's what keeps the screen from disintegrating over time. But they, they're not confident that they can sell this online. Is, is my point. So now they are canceling all of the original online pre-orders, apparently. They're providing people with, you know, 250 bucks in store credit for the trouble, but you actually have to go into a store to buy this right. because they want that white glove, hands-on I was going to say, the, white, the bespoke white glove cell phone experience so they can literally look you in the eye and say, don't try to peel this off. Right. You understand <laughs> that when you leave here, and I wouldn't be surprised if they make you sign something. Like, when you leave here today, after we've trained you on how to use this phone for an hour, that you will not destroy your $2,000 cell phone. It reminds me of, remember the uh, 20th anniversary Macintosh? Where Vaguely. If you bought one of these things was outrageous design thing. It was one of the first personal computers with an LCD screen. It had a separate mm -hmm. standalone subwoofer. It was just a outrageous design. And if you bought one of these things, which was also stupendously expensive, a car, it wasn't just white glove. It was like ch chauffeur service. They would bring it to your home. <laughs> they would come in and set it up for you on your desk and they would train you on how to use it. That's, so that's what this reminds me of. It's like, this is such a premium product that we're afraid you won't get everything out of it that you could if we don't teach you how to use it. But really, it's just right. fear. If this was an ultra durable thing, like, oh, yeah, get it to your kids. Throw it down the stairs. We love this thing. It's great. You're going to love it, too. Uh, but no, it's uh, we can't sell it to you online because we don't know if you're going to peel that plastic layer off or not. So it's. I mean, it's I, on one hand, I get it. On the other hand, I mean, to, to put this into context, right, that 20th anniversary Mac, that was $7,500 in 1997, which would be, I don't know, like buying an eleven dollars or $12,000 computer today, uh, which is, you know, back, it, you, you know, you buy a decent used car in my universe, maybe not the fancier universes out there, uh, you know, for eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. Um, I'm with you. I'm very curious to see who buys these, how long they, they hold up. It's on sale, I want to say tomorrow, September 6th, or tomorrow as of when we recorded this in Korea. Um, 
and uh, France, Germany, the UK, Singapore, and the 18th uh, U.S. release date. You know, I, I'm I'm laughing because I I feel like you know they're they're going to release it to the troglodytes in the states, the cowboys with their pickup trucks and they're you know beating each other to death with their phones uh, after they kind of sort out some of the early stuff, or maybe they just figure you know. In Korea and in Singapore and France and Germany and UK, they will, you know, they won't be, they won't object to having to go to a physical brick and mortar store to buy that. Um, you know, I also, I thought it was interesting. Uh, in Gadget notes that the Fold Advantage Plus, um, the warranty program, is going to cover quote seventy percent of display repair costs once a year. <laughs> Which actually, I guess, kind of sounds a lot like, you know, you, you get two massive, uh, you know, uh, rebuilds if you buy a two-year extended, you know, super plus cool guy warranty on an iPhone or, or an iPad. So I guess in, there's some logical sense there. But, um, you know, I'm really curious. I'm really curious to see if seams show up if it you know it it's 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 a complex piece of engineering and people are cruel uh and not even cruel it's just you know like you pointed out it's a phone's just part of your loadout when you leave the house and i'm really curious to see how these hold up i'm also really curious to hold one and see if it feels you know like holding a paperback book or if it feels like holding a modern phone so yeah, I don't know. It's thick. When you fold it in half, it's like a deck <laughs> on top of each other with the air gap between them, which is disconcerting. Right. Don't sit. Don't put it in your back pocket. Whatever you do, please. You don't want to sit. What was that terrible thing. crunching? Well, apparently they actually added additional metal to reinforce everything, along with that that new hinge design and the oh, seriously, so now it's this is even not heavier off than cover. it was before. Yeah. <laughs> The world's if you're wondering, pound smartphone. Oh my goodness! You know, I've I've often said I will cheerfully take a thicker, sturdier phone with more battery life over a thinner device, but this is not what I was thinking. Just want to oh, point that okay. out. All right. Oh my goodness! If you want to know what Sebastian's thinking, well, first of all, you should be listening to Twitch. Twit.tv/slash Twitch is the place to go to find all the information on how to subscribe, all of our older shows. You can stream directly from the websites. Uh, Twich is the name of the show this week in computer hardware. And what you're looking at right now, if you're watching our video, there's a video available in case you want to see what our faces look like. Twit dot tv slash twich um, we love your questions keep sending them in twitch at twit.tv is the email address if you'd like to haunt stalk or otherwise keep abreast of what's going on with mr sebastian peak i highly recommend you spend your days online over at pcper.com and uh, he is the editor-in-chief and you can read all of the reviews he talks about on the show from pcper at that website keep up with me at well twit.tv slash twitch or head over to avxl this weekend avxl.com we should have a new episode posted up on avxl and uh yeah thank you each and every one of you for listening or watching and please keep sending in those emails to twitch at twit.tv and we'll do our best to answer them or of course you can tweet at the incredibly creative at sebastian peak or at patrick norton because that's the way we roll <laughs> with that ladies and gentlemen Branding. <laughs> I'm not ranting yet. I'm better. No, I said branding. It's branding. It's not branding. that we're not creative. It's that we're we our names are our brand. I guess. Or I I'm now envisioning like us as processor names and what they would be. And I, I'm just going to stop right there. <laughs> no, I, I, I will tell you right now. I am the i386 DX. But no, you continue. H having actually lived on on a, a on a 386 DX. You're so much better than that. You're at least a Pentium 90. I, I said <laughs> DX, Patrick. It's the, I'm on the, the 33 megahertz version that could still be downclocked with a turbo button to 16. No, we're going to get you at least to the 20th century. <laughs> at least to the 20th century, which isn't a Pentium 90, but that's a whole other conversation. Oh, my goodness. I'm Patrick Jordan. And I'm Sebastian Peake. We'll catch you next week on Twitch. 